If you look at Reputation as a whole, I would call it a love album with a side of Language. I don't know if we're swearing in this, so if you need to bleep that out, you can. <laughs> but I think if you've only... <laughs> I hope your mother's not watching this. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of This and That Coffee Chat with the Harrahs. We're coffee. actually drinking coffee this time. <laughs> it's yes. actually the morning. Um, after a pretty heavy economic week last week, we don't have very much on the economic side this time, although some big adjustments coming out yes, um, very much on, so. on some economic data. And then it is officially passed August 17th, which means that the new NAR, National Association of Realtors, uh, rules have gone into effect. This is from the settlement that we've mentioned a couple of times. And so we'll just quickly highlight what does that mean for you as a buyer or a seller. Um, and then we've got some auto... Premier League stuff is back. Premier League's back. We've got some motorsport related uh, stuff to talk Insanity. about. Insanity. Yep. Yes. Um, and then a few other this and that items. Okay. So that's, that's the agenda for today. Well, where do we want to start? Let's get back into that economic uh, revised data that we've got. <sighs> okay, well, uh, well, let's first do uh, this week's data, the more current stuff, and then, okay. w which just is really quick. So, uh, this week, jobless claims came out. They edged a little bit higher again, but... Uh, according to the, the headlines in the story, layoffs remain low in spite of the information that we shared with the, the tech layoffs last week. Right. Uh, so, you know, nothing shocking in the jobless claims other than, once again, it has edged up a little bit more. Okay. Uh, this week in lovely Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, <laughs> the world um, leading economists, including you know, leaders of the Fed and the Japanese um, National Bank and some of the European National Banks are all meeting there to talk about the global economy. And then on Friday, uh, Jerome Powell is expected to make his comments. Historically, Jackson Hole, this Jackson Hole meeting, has been when chairmen of the Fed have tipped their hand on future rate increases or rate decreases. So... The, the world is listening. Uh, but what's really interesting and what you kind of teased a little bit is um, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics came out with revised data from April 2023 through March of this year and indicated that the United States added 818,000 fewer jobs than previously reported. So that's a change of an average of 242,000 jobs per month down to 174,000 jobs per month. That's a 28% change from what was previously forecasted. That's a big difference. That is a, a extremely significant difference and hopefully somebody's looking into why their numbers were so far off because typically when you're looking at over 200,000 jobs a month you're you're thinking the economy is pretty strong in the United States when you drop below that number that gives a different indication of what's going on in the economy and I think the Fed may have acted earlier yeah. on rate cuts had they had this data more accurate and they've been talking about how this employment data is what they are heavily relying on on making these cuts. And so if their data has been inaccurate for a year. Yes. Not great. Not great. So most of the markets are now building in a 50 basis point reduction in September uh, as a result of this. You know, some folks were already there uh, mm -hmm. with the 50 points and, you know, Typically, the Fed doesn't like to do big cuts like that. They like to do the 25 basis point cuts. Mm -hmm. But this data, along with uh, the slowing job market, really, I think, is shoving them uh, towards a, a larger rate decrease than, than typical. Mm -hmm. 
coupled with you know, good inflation numbers, not great inflation numbers, but trending the right direction inflation numbers, right. I think this is going to really open things up come September. We've gone from no rate cut to potentially a 50 basis point rate cut in not a lot of time. Yes, and again, as we mentioned last week, uh, many folks are forecasting additional rate cuts November through the end of the December. year. Yeah, yeah, November and December, which would total a full percentage point, which is not insignificant. So things will be ramping up quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it for this week's economic news. Not that it was insignificant, just not as many numbers as we've had to report the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So on the real estate side, as I mm -hmm. mentioned, the new NAR rules are in effect. Yes. And so I think three things to sort of highlight out of this settlement that will really actually impact sellers and buyers. Um, obviously more that we see and that we experience because we're living it every day. But for the buyers and sellers out there, I think these are the three things to know. And, and just a quick comment. Um, we had a meeting yesterday and we talked about this impacts us realtors more than it really does buyers and sellers. Right. It's more information we have to explain. It's more forms that we have to yep. require people to read, understand, often sign. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't know that there's going to be a huge net impact um, to buyers and sellers other than, gee, the last time I bought a home, I didn't have to do all this stuff. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So on the seller side of things, you still have the opportunity and the option if you want to, to offer compensation to the broker that's bringing the buyer to your listing. Um, previously, at least in our paperwork, this number was sort of wrapped into what you were paying the listing broker, um, and it was never really divided, divided out, out into right. kind of two separate numbers. And now the way that this is working is it's clearly separated of you know, we'll have a negotiation between us as your listing agent and you as the seller, but then there's also the opportunity to negotiate between you and the buyer as to what you are paying the buyer's agent, if anything. Right. Um, and so I think in some ways this is good, and I think in some ways it's gonna lead sellers to have to make more decisions, and I think sometimes that's hard, especially right now because we don't have a lot of data on what if you do you know zero percent compensation versus two percent compensation versus four percent compensation what does that mean we don't have the data to to be able to tell you you know this changes days on market or this doesn't change days on market we just don't know yet and so i think until we start to get some of that data it's just another decision for sellers to make that's going to be a little bit more difficult in some instances somewhat stressful yeah it adds another layer of stress that we really didn't have before. before yeah so um it'll be interesting to see how we, we have a number of listings coming up and this is a conversation as a matter of fact as early as tomorrow morning that we're going to be <laughs> yeah. having with with one of our clients and there just isn't enough data out there and and one mm -hmm. of the things we talked about at our meeting yesterday is hopefully because we're a fairly large brokerage that we can collect data on is there an impact on offering different co-op amounts mm -hmm. on days on market or ultimate sale price or mm -hmm. those kinds of things because it's going to be really important for us to have that data so that we can better inform our clients yep. that okay if you only want to offer two percent as an example here's the impact you can expect to be on the market for an additional 15 days you can expect to get an offer that is x percent below mm -hmm. Or it might be, there really There's isn't no any change. difference. Yeah. And so go ahead. Go and, offer less. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and offer less. And then if the uh, uh, offer comes in and they want to adjust the buyer mm -hmm. broker compensation as part of the offer, then, okay, then we'll, we'll have that conversation when that happens. Yep. So, but we don't have that data yet. And yep. so hopefully within six months, we'll have enough data that will be st statistically significant that we can then advise our clients as the best route to go forward. Yeah. 
depending on their needs. Right. If they want the highest return on their investment, it might be one choice. If they just need to get the house sold, that's another choice. So yep. those are all things that we already weigh into the conversation. Right. It's just now another variable. Yeah. And I think there are going to be some sellers out there who are going to be like, nope, I know exactly the number I'm doing and I don't care you know, what the data says, this is what I'm sticking to. Yep. And then for others, it's going to be another decision to make. So. And, and that's our role is just to advise folks mm -hmm. on, on the uh, potential consequences of different choices yep. and, and the good, and then, the bad. Yep. The good and the bad and the good, the bad and the ugly. We move on. Yep. So that's on the seller side on sort of both sides, but I think affecting the buyers more. The multiple listing service or the MLS, um, which is where all of our data is pooled on all these properties that are on the market, they can no longer advertise what that potential commission is that's being offered from the seller to the buyer's broker. Right. And I think this is the one piece of this lawsuit settlement that we've been most frustrated with because it just feels like such a lack of transparency and this whole lawsuit has been about you know like what is or isn't being shared and you know people being told of what isn't negotiable even though it was always negotiable but then if you can't even share what someone's offering eh, i don't love that part of it um, there are some workarounds and Agents are definitely getting creative on how to make these workarounds happen, um, but there's no sort of easy one place for buyers to go anymore to know what is being offered. Where this matters is that buyers are now required to have an employment agreement in place. This is part three of this. Have an employment agreement in place with a broker before they can tour a single home. So even if you only want to see one home, if it's you know the neighbor's home and you want to buy it for your sibling, we can't take you and show you that home unless you sign an agreement with us to be working with us. And on that agreement, it talks about the, the compensation that we as the agents or as the broker um, brokerage would be getting. And so if we have an agreed upon number there, but you as the buyer don't have a way to see what the seller is offering, it just adds in more steps. It takes a little bit longer to get this process going. Um, and I just wish that that piece was included. The, the listing of the, the, the yeah, the co-op, the co-op. Yeah. Fee. Yeah. So, uh, again, our, our, we land on the side that there's a lack of transparency there. Yeah. And we've always been doing buyer broker agreements with our clients. So this isn't new to us, but it is very much new, probably to over 90% probably. of the agents out there. So 90% of the buyers out there have never had to sign one. Yeah. Um, and I'm just pulling that number out of the air, but I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm pretty darn close to, yeah. to that. And, and one of the things that we always said is, you know, if, if we're working for 3%, we will let you know before we show you a home if it's offering less than 3% because you know that you'll have to make up the difference. Yep. Well, now we have to go on a safari uh, to find out what mm -hmm. the, the uh, listing broker is offering. And sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes that information is not publicly displayed anywhere now, depending on the brokerage. And then it falls on us, can we get a hold of that listing agent? If we can't get a hold of the listing agent, then we're sort of walking into showing that house blind as far as knowing what our buyers might need to pay. Right. Um, and I think that may create some frustrations down the road, depending on how many of the brokerages end up having their co-op be publicly available somewhere, you know, on their websites or whatnot. Right. And, you know, from the other perspective, I think that the viewpoint was that by having it publicly available on MLS, that through sheer peer pressure, you were colluding to set fees at a certain mm -hmm. point. Um, 
That certainly didn't stop the I brokers from listing 1% on theirs and mm -hmm. whatnot. Uh, so, so we'll see. Now we are fortunate at, at Long Realty that because we're, we were not covered with the initial NAR settlement, we still have to follow it, but we're not covered by it, mm -hmm. that we have a separate agreement through uh, Home Services of America. And through that separate settlement, we are allowed to publish our co-op fees on our own website. So whenever we're looking at another long listing, uh, we are able to quickly find what they are offering. Mm -hmm. um, we have a client coming in from town this weekend that's going to look at close to 10 homes. And so Kelly had to do some sleuthing yesterday. And Yeah, I still have some calls to make on ones that I could not find yes. a number for. Yeah, so. So that's the co-op part of it. And then as I mentioned, now have to sign an agreement. Um, I think this is a good thing because this will better define that relationship between the agent and the buyer. So I do like this part of the settlement quite mm -hmm. a bit. It's mm -hmm. just, again, you have to do it before you see any properties. And so it may be that you want to interview a few agents before you really get into your home buying process, something that we had advocated for before. Right. You know, because there's a certain amount of of yes competency and do you know how to do the job but there's also a certain amount of personality match in this process yes. and if you're going to be miserable working with that agent for the next you know three or six or 12 months right do you really want to work with them well and the nice thing is that agreement can last for as little as one day mm -hmm. or up to a year so you know if you just want to try out a, a buyer's agent yeah you can do it for a week Yep. You know, and, and go look at a number of homes. And if you don't feel like you're clicking or you're not comfortable with the vibe or whatever, once the week's up, you can go out and find yourself another another agent, another buyer agent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, we do have in our list uh, a home buying guide of uh, video that mm -hmm. probably has not aged well. We've, I think, well, I mean, aged well as far as the, the information in it. Um, early video for us, so probably kind of... You would probably cringe at your editing? Yes, yes, <laughs> I would probably cringe at my editing. So, anyway, uh, I'll put a link in, in the description <laughs> so that if you wanted to watch our exciting Home Buyer's Guide video, you can. And there's also a link in the description every week on how to download a home buyer's guide that we have published for you. So, mm -hmm. do you sorry, have, I ramble. <laughs> do you have anything else on sort of these three bullet points related to the settlement and what that actually means for a seller or a buyer in the market in the next month or two or five? Well, we ran into this this past weekend where we had an investor mm -hmm. that you know, this is all new to mm -hmm. and wanted to look at a specific uh, property. Yeah, one specific property. One specific property and, you know, we asked if he wanted to meet to go over the paperwork at the office, said no, we can just meet at the house and and even though we had told him multiple times, we can't show you the house until we have signed paperwork. So we stood there in the driveway going over the paperwork with him. Yep. And, you know, he, he's a, a smart man. He said, that's a lot of information. I want to take this home yep. and look at it. So we ended up not showing the house. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you're going to run into that a lot with buyers. Mm -hmm. On the other side, uh, we heard from another agent in our office this week where the buyers wanted to look at a house that based on what they described to her that they were looking for. This house didn't meet any of the criteria, but they really wanted to go see it. And she said, I can't show it to you until you uh, mm -hmm. sign an agreement. You can sign it for one day, da, da, da. And they decided it wasn't worth, probably Some, saved her lots of time yep. because uh, they weren't going to buy that house anyway, yeah. based on what they had described that they wanted to do. So, so there's going to be trade-offs mm -hmm. here early on until people get used to the fact that if I want to go look at a house, I have to have a, a contract. Now, you, you're always free to go to an open house unrepresented. Yes. That's fine. But as far as having somebody open up the door for you, mm -hmm. um, you need to have this agreement. Yep. 
Sorry, again, rambled. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's what we're seeing right now. So, yep. you know, in a couple of months, things might change and we might have a different perspective on this because it is changing really quickly right now as these rules get implemented and people learn more about them. Yes. So. It's a learning process for everybody, the, yep. for the customers and for uh, us in the industry. Yep. We'll see how it goes. Yep. All right. But one thing's for sure. Homes will be purchased and homes mm -hmm. will be sold no matter what. Mm -hmm. What's next? Do you want to talk soccer? I'll, I'll talk briefly soccer. Okay. I, I was able to get quite a, a good Premier League fix this last weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, no real big surprises uh, as far as outcomes of matches, except for one. And that would be the Monday Mondays. night I was going to say, this is Monday's night. <laughs> with <laughs> my, my Leicester City Foxes taking <laughs> on Tottenham Hotspurs. And um, I really was dreading watching that game because I had watched, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. Leicester in, in the preseason. And not until right before the match did I learn that Jamie Vardy had come back into training on Friday. And he'd been out since the first friendly of the preseason. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, you know, we're probably not going to see him. Well, not only did we see him, but he started the darn game. Mm -hmm. And then he scores the tying goal in the 70 some minute of of the match and i'm like this guy's 37 years old he's been in training for two days uh and he's out there playing again at top level yeah not only that his his trash talking <laughs> was top level um, as he was exiting the field he pointed to the premier league badge and said we have one and then pointed to the tottenham fans and said you guys have zero uh, as he marched off the field. Yeah. There is a uh, great video by Zeeland Shannon. Yep. I will put a link in there uh, that just talks about at 37, not only is he still <laughs> at the top of his soccer game, he is at the top of his, his trash talking game as well, because that's not the only thing he did during the match. And so, yeah. Uh, if if you're not a Leicester City fan, you probably hate the guy. But yeah. as a as a Leicester City fan, I'm I'm so happy <laughs> that he is on my side. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, again, a draw. That way, I'm excited about a draw. <laughs> it is against one of the big six clubs. Right, and with where they're projected to finish this season, those one point games might make a difference on them staying up or them getting relegated so yes i'll take every point we can get yep yeah so that that's that was my my big premier league highlight over away. the weekend yes so i got sad news this week that my lady jane is not being picked up for season two and I was really disappointed about that because they totally left a great ending of season one to work into season two. And it had a 94% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Which, is that the, the left rating or the right rating? I don't know. I'm oh. just reading the... Oh, okay. But it, this article is saying that fans and critics alike... Oh, okay. ...liked the show. And I think it was just a little too niche of a genre to like really kind of spread. But I was also wondering about this, that like if it had been on Netflix rather than Prime, would it have done better? Because Netflix already has that fan base of like Bridgerton. And right. I feel like in a lot of ways, this is sort of similar to Bridgerton. And when I go on to Prime Video and sort of like scroll through their originals, or whatever they call them. Yes, they call original, them They call yes. them originals too. Yeah. So when I scroll through the, the prime originals, I don't have a whole lot that like really stands out to me out of their sort of selection. Whereas like when I go onto Netflix and look at their originals, it's like, oh, this looks interesting. Oh, I've watched this. Oh, you know, I could maybe get into this. And so I just wonder if maybe 
they haven't built out their... Well, if you, you look at their top originals, you're talking about Jack Ryan, mm -hmm. which, you know... Not the same fan base. Not the same fan base. You're talking about Reacher. Not the same not, fan. Not the same fan base. Even The Man in the High Tower mm -hmm. is a completely different yeah. genre yeah. altogether. Yeah, even though it's historical, it's very different. Yes, and it's an alternative reality right. series. So, yeah, you, I, I think you're right there. It'd be, I'd be curious if Netflix wouldn't want to then swoop in and, and buy the rights, because it does fit into that Bridgerton mm -hmm. um, style mm -hmm. show. Uh, it's happened before where series have been cut by one network and then somebody else picks, picks it up. You know, Lord knows they destroyed the Lord of the Rings um, Genre. Rings of Power. The, the Rings of Power. Yeah. Well, I also wonder, like, if they hadn't spent such a ridiculous budget on making <laughs> those terrible shows, would they have had more budget that they'd be willing to put into making a second season and trying to create that fan base? Build that audience. And, yeah, build a different type of audience for this show. Yeah. Hard to say. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I would have liked to see a second season. So have you uh, uh, met your goal of staying away from Emily in Paris until the second half of the season drops? So far, yes. Um, I was very tempted that first day when I <laughs> pulled up Netflix and it's right there as like the banner show. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh man. I'm like, okay, what else do I have to watch? Let me go find something that you know I started but never finished and can get back into. And so... Yes. Okay. All right. I, so far, we're, what, one weekend? One weekend. <laughs> and you have to make it to how far into September? I think it's like September 12th. Okay. Um, let me see. Five minutes later. September 12th, yeah. Okay. Right. So, another 20 days. Okay. All right. We'll see if I make it. But yes, so far. Well, you can make it to September 11th and then watch the first half and then on the 12th watch the second half. That is true, yes. Yes. Or even a little bit before that start watching it. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I think the next thing I have is the F1 content creator copyright strike that has been going on. And if you follow F1 already and you follow any content creators over the last couple of weeks, you've probably already seen this and this yeah. probably come across your feed um, but the gist of what happened is that f1 sent out a, a bunch of cease and desist to a ton of content creators um, that use f1 or formula one in their names or in the merch that they create or whatever the situation might be um, and i think some of the the irony that people are seeing in this is one a lot of these content creators are making better content that helps F1 grow as a sport than what F1 actually makes itself. Yes. And two, F1 has partnered with these content creators before, including ones that have used you know, F1 in their name, and apparently didn't have an issue with it at that time. So then the question is, why do they have an issue with this right now? And we're talking about you know, garage passes, access yes. to the teams, to build do content, yes. some sponsorship, uh, uh, deals included in that. Yep. Yeah, so we're, we're not talking just casual. Mm -hmm. we're, we're talking, yeah, come in and do content. And now they're and promote us and promote us. And now they're saying, yeah, stop doing that. Yeah. So um, one of my favorite sort of F1 related um, writers, I guess, um, since it's mostly writing that she does, is Lily Herman. She has uh, an e-newsletter called Engine Failure. And so just this morning, she released her uh, newsletter on this topic. Um, and I won't go into it too much, but she makes some really interesting points in here about the fact that they've partnered with them and that they you know, didn't have these issues before and now all of a sudden they do and what might be the cause of that coming up now. Um, and Can I ask a question real quick? Mm -hmm. So she doesn't have Formula One in her title, does she? 
I mean, engine failure. Engine failure, a Formula One culture newsletter. Ah, is it's her the, it's subtitle that. Tagline, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, the main part is just engine failure. So she was able to, to get her hands on um, a few of these content creators cease and desist letters that they got and then to read the whole things. And then she also got a few um, screenshots and then heard from a few others that they got them but didn't see anything. So she was actually able to, to look at some of the source material that I think a lot of us don't get to see um, because she's actually a journalist also. And so um, her write up on this is really interesting. Um, and I think also part of this write up is where do content creators go from here? What's the next step for them? Do they even still want to be content creators? Um, I've, and I haven't just heard this from her, but I've been hearing some you know, rumblings of people really feeling like the social media algorithms are seriously stifling their reach and just being super frustrated with that and that they've just like stalled out on their growth here recently. And so it'll be interesting to see how many of them stay in the game, how many of them decide to leave uh, in the coming months, how many are successfully able to pivot and maybe do motorsport in general rather than just right. specifically F1. Um, I know at least one that I follow has branched out to all sports and so she was like you know i'm going to talk about f1 but i'm also going to talk about all these other sports we're coming off the olympics where there's a lot of exposure to other sports that you might not normally watch and so she's going to start covering some of those that maybe don't get as much coverage and we saw a video and i'm sorry i don't remember the creator's name this week where he's gone into indycar mm -hmm. as in in part he had already gone into IndyCar, but now he's happy that he started covering IndyCar because of this mm -hmm. um, copyright strike and cease and desist mm -hmm. uh, order uh, from Formula One. Uh, and so, you know, he uh, put out a very strongly worded video. Um, and if I can find it again, I, I will put a link in the description below so you can see one content creator's uh, feelings on all of this. Right. Uh, the other thing that I think is is sort of disappointing about this is that, like for me getting into F1, that happened as an adult, right? Like I was already a fan of NASCAR, but I grew up watching NASCAR. And I feel like as a kid, you know, you, your dad watches NASCAR, so you go watch NASCAR with your dad and eventually you get into it also. And, you know, it sort of comes. But as an adult, your attention is torn so many different ways. Right. And so you might start watching a season, but if you watched like last season or the season before, they were really boring seasons as far as on track racing. And so if you don't have- Max Verstappen driving away from the field. Exactly. And so if you don't have like a community or something else that's keeping you invested in it, particularly as an adult, I think it's really easy to get kind of drawn out of that and not really pay attention and, be like, well, is it really worth it to get up at 6 a.m. every morning, West Coast, <laughs> yes. you know, folks here to watch this race that's happening in Europe? Um, and so, like, for me, when I started getting into F1, that's when I found Two Girls, One Formula, who I've talked about on here before. And they've created, you know, a very welcoming community, particularly for women and people who feel mm -hmm. like they maybe didn't have a community beforehand. Um, well, let, let me pause just a little bit because th there is, for the old hardcore Formula One base, there's a little bit of the similar attitude to the European soccer fans here in the America. Mm -hmm. This real snobbery of, oh my God, you don't even understand. It's called a pitch. It's not a field yeah. type thing. And, and there was a lot of that in Formula One yes. as well, you know. Uh, a few years back. A few years particular. back. So it wasn't a very welcoming sport yep. if you didn't grow up with it and didn't understand everything. Heaven help you if you asked a question during a race. Yeah. So. And in so, case you didn't know, no offense to our 86% male crowd, but dudes on the internet can kind of be assholes. So <laughs> if you're trying to learn, yes, it wasn't the place to do it until these communities were created exactly that allowed for those questions to be answered and there were people that were you know hardcore fans that came into those communities 
and then helped educate everyone else. And so it, it wasn't just a bunch of newbies, it was these bigger communities that could help each other without right. being, okay, the one, one good piece of, of F1 created content, without being Sebastian Vettel naming every past F1 champion, you know, going back to the beginning. That is one video every year that it comes up from <laughs> Grill to Grid that I <laughs> rewatch because it was so impressive. But there is a lot of that attitude of, oh, you can't name all the, the past champions, then why are you here? You are not worthy. Yeah, you're not a fan, really. Yes. And obviously, Drive to Survive is what introduced yeah. many people around the world to the sport that otherwise would have never turned it on. Mm -hmm. um, if they did turn it on, they might watch it for 30 seconds and go, I pfft. Yeah, I don't know anything. Yeah. I don't know the drivers. I don't know the teams. Yes and just moved right on. So so in conjunction with Drive to Survive on Netflix and these niche mm -hmm. content creators, mm -hmm. they've really grown the audience. Yep. And I think Formula One just stepped in it. Mm -hmm. Now there's a fairly famous movie actor that has a Formula One channel and, and uh, he's mentioned in this, um... Yes, so um, apparently Dax Shepard also got a cease and desist um, in previous months for his uh, F1 EFF space WON with DRS um, spinoff podcast from his main, um, was it armchair expert? Yeah, armchair expert. Um, and as someone who actually has the resources to fight something like this, unlike these content creators that, you know, make some nice pocket change maybe on the side if they make anything. Right. He actually has the ability to tell F1 to go shove it and come what may and see what happens on that. So yes. it will be interesting to see if anything more comes of him and his ability to actually fight F1 on something like this. Yes. And before we started the podcast, uh, Kelly and I were talking about this. This reminds me, and, and one of the advantages of being as old as I am, <laughs> is I've seen sports do this before, particularly motorsports. Yeah. And I call it getting too big for your britches uh, attitude. And, you know, back when I was with NASCAR, and even before I was with NASCAR, there was an incredible different vibe between going to an IndyCar race from the fan perspective and a NASCAR race. Mm -hmm. And this is pre-IndyCar split. And getting access to the drivers, getting access to the pits, all that stuff in IndyCar was nearly impossible. Mm -hmm. Nearly impossible. Whereas NASCAR was open arms, Pit access wasn't terribly hard. Drivers would uh, often be out signing autographs uh, for uh, the fans for hours on end. Yeah. Richard Petty would famously wait until the line was completely gone before he would ever leave an autograph session, mm -hmm. as an example. And this is you know years after he had finished racing. Mm -hmm. uh, and and then when NASCAR started to really get big and popular. After IndyCar split. After yeah. IndyCar split and their decline, uh, you saw NASCAR do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They started really limiting access. You didn't have as many autograph sessions. You didn't have, it was really hard to get pit access, uh, garage access, mm -hmm. even in the days leading up to the race. And then you all of a sudden, you know, people find other things to do. There's a lot of competition out there for entertainment dollars. Mm -hmm. And if, if people can't have the kind of experience that they got used to having, mm -hmm. they'll stop going. And so you've seen a similar decline for NASCAR, and now you're starting to see them reopen up mm -hmm. things. Uh, IndyCar definitely has opened really up things. Really reopened, yeah. Uh, matter of fact, we were going to be up in Portland this weekend for the IndyCar race, and schedules didn't align for various reasons, and we were going to have paddock access for the entire weekend, plus mm -hmm. seating 
in, for not very much money. For not very much money, and and so you, oh. I, I'm seeing Formula One go through that same cycle, and all you have to do is look at IndyCar in the United States and NASCAR, and they've already lived it. Mm -hmm. And Formula One fans, it's already one of the most expensive uh, oh, sporting God. events to go to. People yeah. will find other things to do with their money. Yeah. And especially when you're talking motorsport, because there are so many series mm -hmm. and so many different types of racing and cars that it's not like, you know, soccer where it's like, well, I guess I have to go find, you know, a totally different sport if I don't want to watch soccer, you know, or maybe you watch a different country's league. Right. Um, but you don't have to like totally pivot. It's still a car with four wheels, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there are going to be similarities. You're not picking up a totally different sport. You're just pivoting from F1 to IndyCar, still open wheel racing, slightly different rules, right? you know, or you're pivoting from, you know, that to NASCAR or to IMSA or, you know, whatever it might be. There are options out there that aren't yes. Formula One with no access, no good content, not allowing creators to make good content. Yes. So this will be interesting to, to see how it plays out. It'll be interesting to see what some of the, the you know, more popular creators do. Mm -hmm. um, one of the pair of creators that we often watch is Matt and Tommy on P1. Mm -hmm. They had started the WTF1 channel mm -hmm. and then sold it, continued as content creators after they sold it and then the owners of WTF1, for some odd reason, decided to go a different direction about two years ago, year and a half ago. And uh, it's so Matt blurring and together. <laughs> yeah, so Matt and Tommy went and formed P1, which doesn't have Formula One in it or anything like that. So I don't know if they got hit with anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't dove deeply into their Twitter and what else uh, accounts to to see. They're still putting out content. But I also wonder about WTF1. Yeah, but WTF1 still exists. And that's a pretty big brand in the F1 content creator space. Yes, it's it's a very big brand. So um, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this all turns out. Yeah. Um, and you can add a, a link to Lily's right up here so that yes. people can read that if they would like to see her take on it. And get exposed to somebody new that you might not have heard of before. Yes. Yeah, I don't always agree with everything that she writes, but it always makes me think, so. That's that's a good thing. There's always something to noodle over after reading her articles, so, yeah. Okay. So, I think my last thing from this week was that Taylor Swift has wrapped up her Europe leg of the Eras Tour, and will be off for two months now before coming back to the States and then to Canada. And we still don't have a Reputation Taylor's version release date yet that I've been waiting for. <laughs> so, so turns out I'm a Reputation girly. Who knew? Not me when it came out seven years ago. Um, but yes, that has become my favorite album of, okay. of hers. And so I've been waiting for this drop to happen at some point. So perhaps one of the worst things that can happen to me is uh, when Kelly and I uh, drive to see Grandpa <laughs> Dave, uh, she'll start plugging in on my uh, YouTube music uh, Taylor Swift songs. And then for like a month and a half <laughs> after that trip, I still get a really frequent stream of Taylor Swift songs on on my my um, my mix, mm -hmm. and and I I just noticed about uh, two weeks ago that finally I'm not getting <laughs> any Taylor Swift songs in my feed from not our trip in May. From our trip in May, <laughs> <Yeah>. yes. Uh, <laughs> now, mind you, it's not that I dislike Taylor Swift. It's just that you don't know her music I other than her early country stuff. Exactly. Yeah. E exactly. So. Um, well, and that was sort of me, too, is because, you know, when her first couple of albums came out, we listened to those. 
um, because they were on the country radio. And then Red, her fourth album, was the one that sort of started to bridge between country and pop. Some of those songs are more country. Some of them are clearly more pop. Mm -hmm. And it was about then that I sort of stopped listening and wasn't, like, knew that stuff came out, listened to whatever happened to be on the radio, but didn't really listen to the full albums. Mm -hmm. And it was almost 10 years later, it was like summer of 2022 that it, I think some of her uh, folklore albums started popping up on my Spotify mix and, and getting worked in there. And I was like, you know, maybe I should go actually listen to some of these albums again that you know I missed from these eight years of, of not listening. And went back and started listening and I was like, oh, there's some albums in here that I really like. But what I discovered is that if you only listen to what was released on the radio, in my opinion, you're missing her best music. Her radio releases are not her strongest songs. It's a little bit like Bruce Bruce Springsteen, that that fans of Bruce Springsteen say his best music isn't the stuff that made the radio. It's the deep cuts on the albums that's the best stuff. And that's the stuff that they go to the concerts to hear. Yeah. And if you look at the set list from the Eras Tour, there's a lot on, I mean, her big albums like 1989, that's heavily what was released to the radio. But some of these other newer albums, it's some of what was released, but it's also a lot that never got released, but has been you know popular on streaming services and whatnot. Um, and so I think sometimes there's a disconnect if you haven't listened to these albums on what they're actually like. And I think that's the most that way for reputation. Because Reputation was the album that she dropped right after the big like Kim and Kanye debacle and her reputation had gone down the drain and she left public eye for a year and all of that stuff had happened. And so when she released it, it was the whole like snakes and you know, all of that sort of marketing that went into it and this like really edgy album. If you look at Reputation as a whole, I would call it a love album with a side of Fuck you. Language. I don't know if we're swearing in this, so if you need to bleep that out, you can. (laughs) But I think if you've only... (laughs) I hope your mother's not watching this. (laughs) If you're only looking at those songs released from Reputation and the marketing that went into it, you only are really getting the side of it. You're not getting the fact that this is actually a love album. By, by the way, this is the type of deep information that I get on that six and seven hour drive to Las Vegas uh, because I get the whole background to why this song is important and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. Not that I don't do that back to her when I play some 1970s hit song from America or something like that. Or some game that you're deep diving into or yes. whatever else he's happened to rabbit hole down into on that particular week. Yes. So, I mean, you know, it, it's only fair, but. <laughs> so, yes. So, back to when is her version of this album going to be released? My conspiracy corner on this has always been it was always going to be released after the Grammys nominating time period for this year because she already has the album that was released earlier this year Mm -hmm. and reputation was only nominated for one grammy when it came out originally it didn't win and it wasn't nominated for any of the big categories and she had just come off of winning album of the year on 1989 and so my conspiracy theory is that she's angling to somehow get this album a grammy and doesn't want it competing against what's already out there in the same way that when she released red taylor's version she made the you know 20 minute music video to go along with all too well 10 minute version and that ended up winning a grammy and so i'm my conspiracy is that she is waiting for this to have its standalone time with something else going on with it to get it nominated at least well as the probably the most savvy marketeer in the business, uh, even surpassing Dolly Parton, who was a genius business 
woman mm -hmm. uh, and still is. Yeah, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if she has calculated all that. Yeah. Yeah. So the 2025 Grammys, um, this year's nominating period ends at the end of this month. And so I wouldn't expect anything at the very, very earliest until after the end of this month. Well, we also know that if all of a sudden we start hearing Taylor Swift songs on the radio more so than normal, or any artist for that matter, you know that a new album is about ready to be released because yeah. they, it's, the radio stations are into marketing the new stuff by playing the old stuff mm -hmm. leading up to it. So, you know, Labor Day would be a really good time to, you know, the, like the Thursday or Friday before Labor Day mm. might be a really good time to release that so that. I don't know if it's even coming this year. It might not be until 2025. Okay. But um, it's certainly interesting watching the fan base try to figure out when it's going to be dropped. And you know that she sees all these theories too and oh, yeah. totally plays into it. Yes. So. Yes. That is, that is something I am waiting for is when, when is Reputation going to drop? Okay. Yeah. So is it time to talk about what we're looking forward to this weekend? I think so. Well, in spite of Formula One's it is idiocy, is mm -hmm. that a word? I think so. Okay. Close enough. Close enough. Um, I am looking forward to the return of Formula One from the summer break. Mm -hmm. And um, it, Zandvoort is a fun track to watch racing at. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how it goes. They do have that one long DRS down the front stretch that allows for passing and sometimes over aggressive and having to lock up the brakes and drive straight through that corner type action. So we'll see how this goes. We'll see if Max continues to dominate there or if the rest of the teams have, so some of the other teams have caught him now and he has to actually fight for his home track win. Yep. Looking forward to that. Looking forward, of course, to more Premier League soccer and see if Leicester City can follow up on their good outing. Uh, they did sign a new striker from Tottenham, so that should help the team some. We'll see how that goes. And NASCAR has two races left until the playoffs, is that yes, correct? Yes, two races left. And I think they're both restrictor plate races, if I remember correctly, Talladega and Daytona. Okay. And, and which it's just roll the dice and if you miss the big one, then you have a good finish. If you don't miss the big one, um, yeah, you just hope you make it to the end. Yes. And so if you're on the bubble, like Ross Chastain and Bubba Wallace are, mm -hmm. being in the big one or missing the big one could be the difference of making the playoffs or not making the playoffs. Yep, they are at Daytona this weekend in Darlington. Oh, Darlington. That's right. It is Darlington. The weekend after. Oh, that's a great track to finish the the regular season at that is such a tough track mm -hmm. such a tough track well hopefully daytona is at night because uh daytona in august is miserable yes um where is it? which one is it yes it is saturday at 7 30 p.m eastern yeah hopefully by then all the afternoon thunderstorms have calmed down and actually have a dry track to race on. That's a, a late start for 400 miles. Yeah, but when you're going 200 miles an hour, that's just a two hour <laughs> race. <laughs> Assuming no cautions, but yes, you know. Yeah, well, <laughs> when has Daytona ever had no cautions? <laughs> um, I don't know that they ever have. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep, and then September 1st at Darlington. Um, Sunday, Sunday evening that race so that one's gonna be under the lights I, I think that one is a twilight race they start 6 p.m. Eastern time yeah they started in, in the daylight as the sun is setting yep as I've raced that in the sim a few times and um, the, there's this the sun is in your eyes as you go into turn three lovely mm-hmm yes 
All right. I, Anything else? I think that's what I've got for this weekend coming up and this week. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. We will see you again next week. Be sure to like, subscribe. And I was going to... Hit that notification <laughs> bell. I was going to see if you remembered to say that. <laughs> I was yeah. ready to jump in on that one. Perhaps my, my biggest uh, disappointment from this particular podcast is I don't think either one of us overly mangled any English language. And this may be the first, the first video one. <laughs> that we don't have English as a foreign language is English. Mm -hmm. Drop. English as a foreign language is English. So... Mm. You have to give it a rest every so often. Well, only be... No, I don't think so, because <laughs> I, I usually mangle something so badly that it, it calls for the drop. Of course, you were the one that mangled something last weekend. Yeah. And, uh, well, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that reminder. The, the longest outro in history that we're just doing right now. Yeah, well, you can always cut it. 75 years later. You know me better than that. I'm not going to cut bad content because it's good content. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye.